Right. I will uh, explain what this pretty picture is. Uh, probably not today, but um, certainly by by next week. Um, this is a proof that playing checkers correctly is NP hard. Um, okay, so uh, the midterms have been graded. Grades are recorded, um, but they're still muted on, on Canvas until I get back to my office. Um, I was literally just uh, putting them into the system um, 10 minutes before I came here. Uh, the, the average, as expected, was uh, lower than the average for midterm one, but not low enough for me to be seriously concerned. Um, in particular, the, the only real point of concern I have about the exam is that um, one problem in particular um, seemed to kill everybody. Number three. Um, and so in the end, what I'm likely to do is to compute everybody's exam average and then recompute the curves, assuming problem three didn't exist. And whichever of those two grades is higher, that's the one you get. Yeah? Uh, you're given the part of the output of a shortest path algorithm. You're given the predecessor pointers. Um, how do you verify that it really does, those predecessor pointers really do describe a shortest path tree? So the most common answer was, I don't know. Um, it was also fairly close to the average score. So uh, something went wrong with that question. Everything else seems OK. Um, again, a as expected, I think because the material is a little bit harder, the, the, the scores were lower, but, but not low enough that um, with, a, with a few rare exceptions, not low enough that I think that um, you know, there's a systematic problem either with you or with me um, or with the course. It's just hard, um, except for that one question, which, uh, you know, I've had to deal with before. As I said, um, the, 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 the normal strategy when I uncover a question like this that seems to have been un unfairly hard is I'll compute all the curves with all of the scores and then I'll throw that scored out and recompute all the curves. And so I'll compute two letter grades. And whichever of those two letter grades is higher for you, that's the one you will get. Um, in practice, this usually affects about, um, I don't know, something on the order of 15% of the students get bumped from a, a C to a C plus or from a B minus to a B. Um, but still, um, uh, I think it makes sense to do that in this case. Okay. Um, there was one person here and one person here out, outside the, the normal curve range. Um, so uh, these will be back in your hands tomorrow in lab. Um, we haven't yet posted the, the more detailed statistics to the website. Um, uh, those will also be up. Um, by tomorrow. Um, and as I said, all the grades are actually in Canvas. I just have to click the button that unmutes them. OK. Um, any questions about logistics, administrative stuff? OK. So last time, um, uh, I started talking about non-deterministic Turing machines. And in particular, the difference between polynomial time and non-deterministic polynomial time. So uh, uh, there are these two classes of languages, or if you prefer to think of them, yes-no questions, um, where I'm going to feed a string to a Turing machine, and it's going to either accept it or reject it or equivalently, it's either going to return the value true or return the value false. 
Um, P is the set of things where um, there is a Turing machine, and a, I mean a deterministic Turing machine M, such that for all input strings W, if W is in L, then M accepts W. If W is not in L, then M rejects W. And regardless of whether it's in L or not, M halts in either an accept or reject state in, at most, the length of W to, um, you know, after at most a polynomial number of steps. Time on a Turing machine means the number of transitions. So there's some constant C, maybe it's 5, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 374. Um, as long as you can find a constant like that, and a Turing machine that satisfies these three conditions for every string W, that proves that the language L is in P. So an example of a language that is in P is, is this string a palindrome? The set of all palindromes has this property because you can imagine writing a piece of code that scans over the string in linear time and correctly determines whether the string is a palindrome or not. And then we know that we can take a program written on a regular computer and turn it into something done on a Turing machine. And that linear time might become n cubed time, but um, it's not going to blow up more than that. So maybe the C gets blown up, depending on precisely which kind of machine you're running on. Um, but it's always the difference between a smaller polynomial and a bigger polynomial. For NP, there is a non-deterministic uh, non-deterministic Turing machine M such that for all strings W again there are three conditions if W is in the language then there is a sequence of transitions that M might execute that lead to an accept state. Right? That's what it means for a non-deterministic Turing machine to accept. Some uh, sequ sequence of transitions consistent with the, um, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the transition function of the machine makes M except W, meaning if I start with W on the string, there's some tether choices I can make that will land me in an accepting state. If W is not in L, then every sequence of transitions maybe I should say choices here a little bit more accurate, evocative um, makes M reject W. And regardless of whether W is in the language or not, every sequence of transition of, of choices means that uh, M halts in polynomial time. Okay. So there is an asymmetry in the definition of MP. Intuitively, the way you can in interpret this is, if the answer is yes, I can convince you in polynomial time that the answer is yes. If the answer is no, then there's no way that I can convince you. But because you know that I could convince you in polynomial time if the answer is yes, after we've spent polynomial time with me trying to convince you, you can just say, oh, you know what? you would have convinced me by now, no. Okay, So regardless of whether um, the thing I'm trying to convince you of is true or not, the game is over after a polynomial number of steps. If I say, oh wait, just one more thing, say no, class is over, I'm leaving. Okay, um, 
But there is this asymmetry that uh, language being an NP means membership in the language is easy to verify, but non-membership may or may not be easy to verify. And I want to give a particular canonical example of a problem that's in NP that has this asymmetry um, to um, you know, try to try to make it a bit more intuitive why it's there. Um, and of course, the million dollar question is, are these two sets the same? To which um, uh, uh, the answer is, of course. And then we say, well, prove it. And they say, well, um, of course. Right. Um, when actually this very strange situation um, where we don't know how to prove that P is not equal to NP. We all, almost everybody believes it. There are a few weird holdouts who think, well, maybe, you know, maybe we're just not smart enough yet. Um, but not only do we not know that we have a proof, we know that we don't know that we have a proof, in the sense that there are theorems that say this whole swath of techniques that you might use to prove that P and MP are different, they don't work. All right, so um, there are actual theorems that say we don't have a clue how to prove this one way or the other using fairly broad, fairly natural set of proof techniques. So we don't know, and we know that we don't know. But still, we, we, we want to behave as though these are different because well, so far at least it seems to be predictive and we're supposed to be a science and so we develop theories that help predict the behavior of the things that we study. Um, it seems to be a reasonably predictive theory that P, not P and MP are different. So what is this magical problem that I'm talking about? Um, so this object here that I'm showing you in the lecture notes uh, this will be familiar to all the computer engineers um, and pro hopefully somewhat familiar to the computer scientists. This is a Boolean circuit. This is the thing that your computers are actually built out of. Um, each one of those lines is a wire that can carry voltages that are of two different magnitudes one of which represents the bit one, the other represents the bit zero. And those funny looking things that connect the wires together are gates. Those are function, functional objects that, for example, the, um, the AND gate over here on the left that looks like a sideways tombstone, um, if the two voltages coming in are both consistent with ones, then the voltage coming out is also consistent with the one. And under any other circumstance, the voltage coming out of, on the right is, is consistent with the zero. So that, that um, gate computes the function and, x and y. Um, the pointy or looking one computes or, and the triangle with the, 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 the circle on it computes not, it negates. And by combining these, um, by combining these gates into more complicated structures, you can compute any function at all from a sequence of n input bits, which I'm showing here on the left, to a single output bit I'm showing on the right. right? Any function from the set of all possible n bit strings to one bit can be computed by a circuit built out of and, or, and not gates. And moreover, this circuit won't have any cycles in it. Um, you know, to do interesting things with these gates, um, like have persistent memory and so on, you take advantage of the finite speed of light and you, you build loops and you get in this oscillating behavior. But let's just imagine that I'm, I'm, I'm building something that, that the underlying circuit is actually a DAG. You can imagine all those, all those wires as oriented edges pointing from either the input or the output of some gate, the input to the whole circuit or the output of some gate, and pointing to one of the inputs of a gate or the output from the circuit. 
there are no cycles in here. So there's a, there's a steady state that the system can reach, and that steady state will mean that the output of the circuit will be some Boolean function that you've designed for the input. Now, I want you to imagine that um, someone comes up to you with a black box that um, has a bunch of switches on the front. All right, so here's a box. And it's got a bunch of uh, toggle switches on the front, some of which are up and some of which are down. And on the top of the box, there's a light bulb. And the guy says, well, look, I claim that inside this box, there's a Boolean circuit. The input is the, uh, the settings of these switches, up for true and down for false. The output is the light, on for true and off for false. Now, I will let you play with the box as much as you like. And now, what I want you to do is I want you to answer the following question. Is there a set of settings for the switches that makes the light bulb turn on? If you can answer this question correctly, I will give you a trillion dollars. If you answer this question incorrectly, I will take your soul to hell, at which point you realize he has horns, and maybe you should have noticed that he was wearing a red suit and carrying a pitchfork. <laughs> you should not take this bet, obviously. Anyone approaches you with horns and a pitchfork and wearing a red suit, don't take the bet. But um, there's, a, there's a reason why you shouldn't take this bet, and the reason is that provably the only way you can answer this question with absolute certainty is to try all possible settings for those n switches. All right, so if I've got you know, n of these switches, um, then uh, I have no choice but to take 2 to the n time. Right? First, I set them all to zero, and then I pretend to be a little n-bit counter. Okay, and I flip one, then this, then this, then put those down, this up, and um, you know, even if I do one of these a second, um, if there are 20 switches on the front of the box, it'll take me about 10 days. Um, if there are 30 switches on the front of the box, it'll take me about 2,000 days, um, or about what six years. If there are 50 switches on the front of the box, um, forget it. It's going to take longer than there has been writing to um, figure this out. Okay? Um, and so you'll be long dead before you can reliably answer this question. And if at some point you give up early and you lie on your deathbed and said, you know what, screw it, I'm going to say yes or no. If you say yes, you've never seen the light bulb go on. If you say yes, then um, our friend who gave you the box opens the box and says, look, no wires, absolutely no way to turn on the light. And if you say, no, there's no way to turn on the light, then the devil will come and flip the switch to some configuration that you didn't try, and lo and behold, the light will come on. Then he'll open the box and say, see, look at the gates, it's actually doing the right thing. Of course, until he opens the box, you don't know which of these two situations you're in. So as long as the box is closed, the devil can, you know, magically change what's inside the box in a way that you can't detect. Okay, so you laugh in his face, of course. The devil makes you a bet like this. You go, ha ha, very funny. I don't want to spend exponential time doing this because I, you might change the circuit inside the box. And so he says, great, good. It's much more fun if I'm competing against somebody who actually knows what they're doing. So I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll refine the bet. Instead of a black box that you can't see in, I will make the box out of glass. I'll give you a screwdriver. I'll let you open the box. In fact, you know what? Forget it. I'll give you the plans. You build the box yourself. And then, you know everything. I can't touch the box anymore because you built it. 
Um, you know, you can have other people verify it you know, with you. You can spend, you know, as much time as you want, and still, still, you should not take the bet. You've got all the information. The devil can't cheat now. Nevertheless, even if you know the entire circuit, um, the fastest algorithm to decide whether it's possible to turn on the light, so the fastest, what's, uh, the fastest algorithm for what's called satisfiability, is it possible to flip the switches to turn on the light? This is known as the circuit satisfiability problem. The fastest um, uh, SAT algorithm needs approximately two to the end time. You could shave off, a, you know, it's actually something more like two to the n over n squared, but eh, it, that that noise is not really worth worth uh, worth worrying about. Okay, so this circuit satisfiability problem is one of these canonical problems where we don't know how to solve it in less than exponential time. On the other hand, if I want to convince you that the answer is yes, how do I do it? Yes, there is a way to flip the switches so that the light turns on. You just flip the switches, and lo and behold, the light turns on. Now, um, you might say, well, I'm not quite convinced by that, because I don't know what funny business is going on, really. So just based on the plans, all right, so I just give you this drawing. How do I figure out, based on this drawing, um, I want to convince you that if I plug in the right values, on the left, zeros are ones. What will come out on the right is a one. Do you do that? Yeah? It appears like a first search. Um, it's not a breadth first search, but you're close. It's a depth first search. In fact, the way you do it is you topologically sort the DAG. All right, and then the, the things on the far left are just going to be the inputs. You know their values. And then you, you walk from left to right, and whenever you encounter a new gate, you know the values of its inputs, and so you can then write down the value of its output. And so you just walk, walk, walk until you get to the right side, and then you know the value of the output. All right, or yet another way of saying it, if I'm not trying to be so efficient, if I see a gate where I know all the inputs, write down the output. Repeat. Eventually, in fact, after only a polynomial number of steps, even with this brute force way, eventually I'll know what the output of the circuit is. And sure enough, it's a one. OK, you've convinced me. Okay. On the other hand, if the answer is no, there is no way to assign values to the input for this circuit to make the light bulb turn on. Yeah. Um, it's a depth first search because that's what you need to do topological sort. Yeah, I mean you could do it with breadth first search, but there'd be a bunch more bookkeeping involved, and it's yeah. Oh, very good. Okay, so why don't we start on the why don't we start on the right hand side and go left? Good. So the output that we want here is a 1, right? This is an AND gate. So that means the inputs all have to be 1s. OK, now I'll get to this OR gate. What are the inputs? Aha, uh -huh, OK, then you've branched. You've branched once for every OR gate. How many branches is that going to be? Per OR gate, but they accumulate. So now you're back to exponential again, right? So um, there's, no, there's no magic going backwards. I mean, you still end up having to do essentially a backtracking search over, well, is the input two ones? I don't know. Let's try it and find out. And you back up further. Yeah. 
because it might not be. There may be no way to get a one on this wire because the rest of the circuit isn't satisfiable. Or the fact that there's a one here might also force a one down here and, well, that wouldn't work out. I mean, they're, they're, you notice that there are occasionally places where the, bran the wires branch. So they're not totally independent. Right? So it may be by forcing a one up there, I force a one down there, which makes something else impossible. But if I let the thing up there be a zero, everything will relax and it'll be fine. Right. OK, so if I want to convince you that the answer is no, can you think of a fast way to do that? Neither can anyone else. The only, in fact, the only way that anybody knows how to convince someone else that the output to a Boolean circuit is always no, that no matter how you flip the switches, the light bulb will never turn on, is essentially to try all settings of the switches and say, look, it didn't turn on, look, it didn't turn on, look, it didn't turn on, two to the n times. Can, again, you can get a little tiny bit better than that, but, but nothing significant. Okay? So there's this fundamental asymmetry. It's very easy to convince you that I can turn on the light by just turning on the light, but it's very hard for me to convince you that I can't and it's equally hard for you to figure out whether I can or not without me telling you. Okay. So this, is a, this circuit satisfiability problem is in NP. Okay. So And I want you, you know, in terms of thinking of this as a language, I want you to think of circuit sat as the set of all circuits, which I've encoded somehow as strings of bits, that um, can be satisfied, that do have um, uh, inputs that make the output one. Right. For example, if I want to know, is there a way to push the buttons so that the camera will focus? Um, okay. Now, what I want to show you next is um, something called um, the Cook Levin theorem, which says um, now we don't know whether circuit set has a polynomial time algorithm. It could just be that we're all stupid. So, Let's imagine somehow, magically, aliens came from outer space and landed in our backyards and said, oh, circuit set, oh, pff, sure. We, you know, we give that as an undergraduate homework exercise. You can solve it at the end of the 13th time, no problem. Um, I say, okay, great. You just proved that P equals NP. Right? So, if this one problem has a polynomial time algorithm, then every problem where I can just verify yes answers in polynomial time has a polynomial time algorithm. If circuit sat can be solved quickly, all tests are easy. All homework is easy. Proving anything that has a short proof is easy. Right. So, of course, no one actually believes the conclusion of this implication, and therefore, nobody believes the hypothesis either. All right. This is a, uh, one of these theorems of the form, you know, if I have a dog, my dog speaks fluent Chinese. All right. You may or may not know, sitting there, whether circuit set would mean P. I mean, it's, I, I, I'm a tenured professor in a top five computer science department. If I told you, oh, yeah, sure, it says a polynomial time algorithm, you'd probably go, oh, okay. But um, if I tried to tell you that I had a dog that spoke Chinese, you, you're, you're insane. So um, the, the implication is what I will try to convince you of. And then even though it's not really a proof, this is ex 
this is compelling evidence that circuit sad is actually hard and not just hard because we don't know the answer yet. Okay. Right. Um, and so what I really mean when I say p, p equals NP, right, that means for any non-deterministic Turing machine that halts in polynomial time, meaning every set of decisions leads to me halting in polynomial time, there is an equivalent deterministic Turing machine that halts in polynomial time. That's what this what I am what I'm actually going to prove. Okay. All right. So let me remind you a little bit more of what a non-deterministic Turing machine looks like. Okay. So if you remember, generally a Turing machine is something that has an infinite tape. But I can imagine for uh, because I can always have separate tapes that in fact my Turing machine has two tapes. And when I want to decide, the Turing machine wants to evolve, it looks at the two symbols that it can see, one on the input and one on the work. And based on those two characters in its internal state, it decides to change its internal state, possibly write something onto the work tape, and then move either of the heads left and or you know, one head and one left, one head right, or both right, or both stay still, or you know, some set of options of what to do here and what to do there. Right. Um, so this is this is a standard um, deterministic Turing machine. A non-deterministic Turing machine. What you should really be thinking of it as is there's um, an input tape and there's an advice tape in addition to the usual work tape. The user gets to see this. When I want to feed a non-deterministic Turing machine something, I write it onto the, onto the input tape. And then the question I need to ask is, is there something that someone could write onto the advice tape that would make the machine accept my input? Okay. Now, at some level, maybe you can already start to see the connection with circuit satisfiability. Let's just suppose I you know, I fix the Turing machine, and I fix the input string, and then I'm asking, is there something I can write on this advice tape that will make the Turing machine accept? And let's suppose further that the Turing machine actually has a light bulb on the side of it, that when it accepts, the light bulb goes off. And let me assume further that the advice tape is made of zeros and ones. And so, in fact, instead of writing zeros and ones there, I'm just going to have a bunch of switches. It looks like that, except there's a Turing machine inside instead of a circuit. Right? So really, all the Cook-Levin theorem is saying essentially is um, if there was some way to figure out the answer to this question that I want for non-deterministic Turing machines. Is there an input that, that, that makes the light bulb go off? Whatever method I use to do that is actually a Turing machine. Yeah? Um, is there a way of setting the advice tape so that the Turing machine will accept my input string? OK. All right. So let me try to make this a, a, a little bit more um, a little bit more concrete. Okay, so let's um, this is the theorem that we're trying to prove. So let's um, fix some non-deterministic Turing machine M, and we'll fix some input string um, 
W. Okay. And now, um, in order to figure out whether this machine accepts W or not, um, I, I, I have to, you know, it, it, this is the same as this question here. Is there a way of setting the advice tape to ones or zeros so that uh, this thing eventually accepts? So what I'm going to imagine doing is I'm going to imagine encoding the um, Turing machine configuration, the sort of global state of the Turing machine by a sequence of bits. All right, so there's some sequence of bits that represent the input tape. There's some sequence of bits that represents the advice tape. There's some sequence of bits that represents the state. There's some sequence of bits that represents the work tape. There's maybe a special bit that, that means the, 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 the head is here. There's some sequence of bits that I can write out that will encode the global state of my Turing machine at any particular moment. At time t. Now, there's another sequence of bits that um, encode the status of the Turing machine at time t plus 1. Now, some of these bits are the same. Right? The input just doesn't change. Right? The advice doesn't change. Most of the work tape actually doesn't change. But then there's something that takes in you know, the bits describing the state and, the, and you know, maybe a small neighborhood around wherever the head is. It goes into some you know, mythical black box and then spits out the new values. Okay, this is, what, this is what effect the transition function has on that sequence of bits. This is some function that takes in a small number of bits and spits out a small number of bits. Any function that takes in bits and spits out bits can be encoded by a Boolean circuit. Right? So I can basically here build um, a circuit in that um, encodes the transition function, right? And the input to this, this, this little, the small circuit that encodes the transition function is just sort of the state and the local part of the, uh, 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 of the Turing machine tape that's near the head, okay? So given a finite, a sequence of bits that represents the configuration at time t, I can build a circuit that will output the configuration at time t plus 1. And then if I built it correctly, the same circuit, if I apply it again, will give me the, the, the configuration at time t plus 2, and again at time t plus 3, and again at time t plus 4. Okay. So in fact, what I can do is put in a bunch of wires that say, you know, this is my configuration at time t equals zero, and there'll be some circuit that'll give me the configuration at time t equals one, and then some circuit, and then the wires here at time t equals two, and eventually, at time, you know, n to the c, whatever it is, there'll be one bit here that represents um, whether to accept or not. Okay? So I built this big fat circuit that simulates the evolution of the Turing machine for however many steps I want. Now there's one problem with this, which is the actual tape is infinite in length. And so if I just follow this slavishly, it seems like I've built an infinite circuit. Why is that not actually going to happen? Why, do, why, why can I get away with sort of cutting off the circuit on the right somewhere, saying, ah, the rest of it doesn't matter? Yeah. 
Well, let me ask the question this way. If I run a Turing machine for 72 steps, how many cells on the tape, at most, how many cells on the tape are not blank? 72. If I run the machine for 10,000 steps, only the first 10,000 cells on the tape were ever touched by the machine. Everything else is blank, and it stayed blank, and it's blank forever. All right, so in fact, because I know that my Turing machine is going to halt after it most end to the C steps, I only have to build an encoding of the first n to the C cells on the tape. Okay. Now, this is a big, fat Boolean circuit. I've got inputs up here that represent the initial state of the machine. Now, some of these I know. Right? I know that my work tape is all zeros. I know that, what, that my initial state is some start state. In fact, I know that my input string is w. The only part that I don't know is the advice. And so if I want, you know, if, if I have some problem in NP, I've got this non-deterministic Turing machine, and I want to know whether it accepts a given string or not, I can now build this circuit out of that Turing machine where the inputs to the circuit are the advice, and the output to the circuit is whether the machine accepts. Okay. Any non-deterministic Turing machine at all, I can turn into a circuit that looks like this. Okay. Now, if somehow, I could answer the circuit satisfiability problem in polynomial time, then in particular, I could figure out whether this circuit is satisfiable in polynomial time. Okay? So the, the, the logic here is M accepts W if and only if this circuit that I built from M and W has a satisfying assignment. Right? So if I can figure out in polynomial time that this circuit can turn on the light bulb, that's exactly the same as saying, um, does M accept this string? But remember, this is the same as saying, you know, W is in whatever this language is that I'm trying to figure out. So if I can figure out whether the circuit works in polynomial time, that's the same as deciding whether a string is in this arbitrary language in NP in polynomial time. And I did this for any language in P, in NP. So if you give me your favorite language in NP, give me a Turing machine that is, you know, proves that it's in NP, I will build this circuit and feed it to my circuit satisfiability subroutine. And in polynomial time, I will tell you for any string whether it's in that language or not. In other words, I've just described a polynomial time algorithm to solve your problem in NP. Um, now, um, I don't expect the details of that proof to go in. We'll see arguments kind of like this later in the semester when we're building things out of Turing machines and then feeding them to other Turing machines, which is kind of what's going on here. Um, except the intermediate thing that I'm building won't be a circuit. It'll be another Turing machine. Um, okay. But if, if the punchline you want to remember is if circuit set could be solved in polynomial time, then P and NP would be equal. In particular, that graph coloring problem that I showed you on Tuesday, that problem is in NP. If I want to convince you the answer is yes, all I have to do is say, color this node red, color that node yellow, color this node blue. And in polynomial time, you can check every edge to make sure that the two colors are different. That process by which you checked everything to make sure the two colors are different can be encoded by one of these gigantic circuits. 
And now I can ask, is there a way of setting the switches? Now there are three-way switches instead of two-way, but that's not really a big difference. To make the light bulb go on, which means, yes, that's illegal coloring. Right? So if I could figure out that's whether that circuit works, that's the same as figuring out whether the graph is colorable. And so the, a problem that has this form, if you could solve it in polynomial time, then p equals np. is called NP-hard. That's what it means for a problem to be NP-hard. If you could solve it quickly, you could solve anything in NP quickly. You could solve graph coloring, you could solve traveling salesman problem, you could solve um, register allocation, you could solve processor scheduling, you could uh, you know, make American Airlines run on time. Um, uh, you could have you know, FedEx here in three hours instead of overnight. Um, you can tell Google how to allocate its server farms. You can tell Amazon where to, where to put its uh, products to minimize the motion that you need for its robots. Um, you could solve all the other open mathematical questions that we hope have short proofs. Right? You need instantly have a short proof of the Riemann hypothesis. Because you'd say, well, I know that a short proof exists, and here I have some code that would verify it. Done. Right. Um, that's what it means. The problem is NP-hard if a polynomial time algorithm would apply this magical fairyland with rainbows and chocolates that nobody believes exists. Okay. But formally, it means if it's NP, then P equals NP. Now, one thing that we don't want to do is if I want to prove that something else is NP-hard, for example, if I want to prove that graph coloring is NP-hard, I don't want to have to go through this, this complicated game of building a graph that you can color if and only if some non-deterministic Turing machine accepts something, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to have to think about Turing machines when I'm doing this NP-hard stuff. So the, the, the Cook-Levin theorem, um, I, I, I should maybe say a little bit about the history here. Um, Cook was an assistant professor at Berkeley. He published his proof of the theorem, which was forever known as Cook's theorem, in around 1973, um, right around the time he was not given tenure. He moved to Toronto. He won a Fields Medal. Berkeley went, <coughs> right. Levin, meanwhile, um, was studying, you know, didn't, he didn't actually phrase it in the sem same time. He actually proved an equivalent theorem um, uh, on the, 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 the dark side of the Iron Curtain around 1972, slightly before Cook, but in the way that, um, uh, you know, publications flowed, it was difficult for these two sides to communicate. And it took actually several decades for people to realize what was going on. So um, Steve Cook uh, went to Toronto. He's still alive. He's you know cool guy. Um, uh, but then uh, one of his colleagues at Berkeley came up with a list of twenty-one NP-complete problems. NP-complete is a is a technical thing. It means it's NP-hard and it's in NP. But the second half of that is kind of uninteresting, so we're really just mostly going to concentrate on proving things are hard. Because once you prove things are hard, that means essentially there's no fast algorithm. You have to do something else. And so what, what Karp did is he said, look, I don't have to go all the way back to the drawing board to prove that something is, you know, I don't have to do this, this non-deterministic Turing machine thing to um, prove that, some, that, that something is NP-hard. Right? If I have some other problem, x, and I want to prove that this is NP-hard, right, all I have to do is show that if I can solve x in polynomial time, then I can solve circuit set in polynomial time. 
right? Because I already know that if circuit set can be solved in polynomial time, then p equals np. So there's a, there's a, you know, this immediately would imply p equals np, but this is by, by Cook and Levin. I don't actually have to do that step myself. All I have to do is show if there's a polynomial time algorithm for my problem, then there's a polynomial time algorithm for Steve's problem circuit set. This implication, we already know how to do this. Right? If I know that problem A can be solved quickly, and I want to prove that problem B can be solved quickly, one of the ways I can do that is I can write an algorithm for B that calls A as a subroutine. Okay? So um, we do this all the time. You know that there are efficient priority queues. You know they exist. They've probably been implemented in some standard library. Um, and so if you want to implement a fast version of Dijkstra's algorithm, you wouldn't bother to write your own priority queue implementation. You would just say, well, there's some priority queue operations here. Let me just call the STL heap. Right? You're relying on the fact that the STL heap is there, even though you've probably never seen the STL heap code yourself. What you're doing is called a reduction. You're reducing the problem you want to solve to some other problem you believe has already been solved, or you hope has already been solved, or you wish somebody would solve already. Okay? This implication, if I want to show this implication, what it means is I need to assume a polynomial time algorithm for x. And then using that assumption, I'm going to build a polynomial time algorithm for circuit set. Which calls this polynomial time algorithm for x as a subroutine. Okay? This is the way that I would prove this implication regardless of what the two problems x and circuit set are. If I want to reduce x to y, I've got to say this carefully. If I want to reduce y to x, I'm trying to build a fast algorithm for y. And to reduce it to x means let's assume x has already been solved. Let's assume the x ferry is already doing its job. Now, using that subroutine as a black box, trusting that the instructions on the outside are correct, now I will build my algorithm for y. Okay, so there is a standard joke about um, reductions. So before I actually show you um, some examples, um, so a mathematician and a physicist were sharing an office, and the physicist was a real slob. He had paper everywhere. He'd spilled coffee all over his paper. He could never find anything. Um, he smoked like a chimney. Um, occasionally, he would leave cigarettes lying around in his coffee things and the ashes and spill everywhere. It stank to high heaven. But, you know, the mathematician was an easygoing guy. Like, yeah, okay. And the physicist was constantly complaining how he could never get anything done because everything was so disorganized. And then one day, he left a cigarette lying on next to, unfortunately, a dry piece of paper on his desk, and his desk caught on fire. And so the physicist comes running in, he grabs the fire extinguisher, he sprays the whole desk down with, with a few gallons of water. Everything on his desk is ruined. He goes and he gets the, 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 the big trash can from out in the hall, and he just scrapes everything off, puts it into the trash can, and says, ah, oh, great. But for the next month, he was the most productive he'd ever been in his life. He put, you know, three papers into science. He got, you know, nominated for the Nobel Prize. But slowly over time, his desk got messier and messier and messier. And meanwhile, you know, the mathematician sitting off in the corner, oh, okay, you know, doing his math stuff. And the physicist starts complaining again about, um, um, 
you know, my desk is really messy. I wish I could get that, you know, productivity stage back. And I've built up all these things from the experiments I'm running. I can't keep anything straight. And the mathematician says, oh, I, we, I know what you should do. He says, really? What? And the mathematician takes a match, whoosh, throws it on the physicist's desk, and says, you know what to do from here. <laughs> right? So the mathematician reduced the problem to something they already knew how to solve. <laughs> right? Um, so uh, one of the things about this word, reduction, is it has this bizarre connotation that you're taking some complicated problem and reducing it down to something simpler. And I want you to take that connotation of reduction and throw it in the trash with all the burnt paper. Okay? Um, it's not actually reducing from a harder problem to an easier problem. It's just producing from one problem to another. Okay. All right, so let me give you an example of what one of these um, reductions might look like. And so the first example is going to be almost trivial. Okay. Um, it's going to be something called SAT. Okay, this is not circuit SAT. The input is not a circuit. Um, you could really think of this now as the input is a Boolean formula, which is something, you know, a Boolean formula is um, equal to, well, it could be true, or it could be false, or it could be a not followed by a Boolean formula, or it could be a Boolean formula and another Boolean formula, or it could be a Boolean formula or another Boolean formula. Okay. And with extra parentheses to make things unambiguous. And if you like, maybe, you know, you could also allow, you know, exclusive or, or maybe you want to allow implication. Um, maybe you want more, some slightly more complicated things, but there's a simple grammar that describes what a legal Boolean formula looks like. Okay, and I'll call this formula phi. Remember, that's not the empty set. Um, and the output is, oh, and, and I actually, I need to also allow the Boolean formula to have variables, right? So there'll be some variables x1 through xn stuck inside the formula. And then the question is, um, uh, can we assign values to the variables so that this formula is true? Okay? Now, maybe it's not too surprising that this question, this, this, um, problem is equivalent to circuit set. Okay. Um, a formula is a way of describing a circuit with text, with symbols. A circuit is a way of describing a formula with wires. It's just notation. Okay. But um, let me actually sort of walk through how the reduction would work. Okay, so I want to assume a polynomial time algorithm for SAT. Somebody runs down the hall and says, I've got a polynomial time algorithm for formula SAT. I say, great, let's use it to build a polynomial time algorithm for circuit SAT. Now, a polynomial time algorithm for circuit SAT would be, well, here's the name of the algorithm, and it takes in um, a, an arbitrary circuit as input. And I have to return yes or no, yes if k is satisfiable, and no if it's not. So in order to do that, um, I want to let phi be a formula describing the function computed by k, 
And then I'll return whatever the sat, your SAT formula says for that formula. Okay, I take the circuit and I transform it into the input that your mythical polynomial time algorithm expects. And then I claim that, that if I do this transformation correctly, provided that SAT is actually correct, that subroutine is actually correct, this algorithm will return the correct answer. Moreover, if, as long as I can do the first line in polynomial time, and by assumption, the second line happens in polynomial time, by assumption, there is a polynomial time algorithm for SAT, then this whole algorithm will run in polynomial time. Okay? So this is the basic outline, the basic skeleton of a polynomial time reduction. And notice here, uh, it is very easy to get backwards. If I want to reduce SAT to circuit SAT, no, if I want to reduce, if I want to prove that SAT is NP hard, let me get this right. If I want to prove that SAT is NP hard, the implication is SAT is equal NP goes to circuit SAT is NP, right? The thing on the left is an assumption, right? I want to assume that there is an algorithm for SAT and use it to build an algorithm for circuit SAT. And ultimately what I'm doing really is a proof by contradiction. Let's assume there's a polynomial time algorithm for SAT. Well, then I can build a polynomial time algorithm for circuit SAT, but that's silly because I'm not a millionaire. I don't have ponies and rainbows and chocolate um, and free Wi-Fi that works even in Siebel. Um, so that, that, that's, that's ridiculous. You can't possibly have a polynomial time algorithm for SAT. That's really what the argument is. Let's assume for the sake of argument that this subroutine actually exists and is fast and use it to derive the existence of something we know doesn't exist. Now, it's because of the contradiction structure in there, it's very easy to get this backwards. It's very easy when you're trying to prove something hard to start out by saying, the problem I'm interested in is SAT. So, of course, I should write an algorithm for SAT. It's like, no, you're not trying to build an algorithm for SAT. You're trying to prove that an algorithm for SAT doesn't exist. And the way you do that is you assume it exists, and you build something else that you've already proved doesn't exist. Okay. So, reduce the problem we know is hard to x. This is reduce circuit sat to sat. Okay, so the details of how you would actually do this reduction are really pretty straightforward. I'll just show you the example, the same, uh, um, the same circuit that I showed you before. Um, I don't even need to put it all on the screen because you'll get the idea right away. Um, so the first bit of the, uh, the, the first part of this formula here, um, what I've done is I've just given every wire in the circuit a name. This is a new variable. And what that parenthesized expression is doing is saying, um, this is an AND gate. The output Y1 is equal to the AND of the two inputs, X1 and X4. And there's a similar one of these for every single wire. Um, and then at the very end, I've also named the output wire Z. And at the very end, I say, OK, um, Z has to be true. And so the way my, the, what my formula looks like is an and of a bunch of simpler formulas. And so in order for the whole formula to be true, every one of the component clauses has to be true. It has to be true that y1 is the and of x1 and x4. It has to be true that y2 is the negation of x4. It has to be true that z is true. And now the question that I would pass to Sat is, is there a way of assigning values to all, in this case, it, I believe it's 12 
um, variables that make this entire expression true. Now, some of these variables are just there to enforce consistency. There are more variables than there were for the circuit, but that's OK. okay. Given an arbitrary circuit, essentially I could just read off the formula by naming the wires, the edges in the graph, and for every gate, that is for every node, writing down outgoing equals appropriate function of incoming. All right, so this transformation clearly happens in polynomial time. And the fact that the circuit is satisfied, what I need to show then, um, which I do in the notes, I want to get to my second example before the time runs out. If the circuit is satisfiable, then so is the formula. I pick a satisfying assignment, propagate it through, that gives me values on the wires. Those values satisfy the formula. And on the other hand, if the formula is satisfiable, then so is the circuit. Pick a satisfying assignment of values in the variables, transfer that back up to the circuit, and then verify that, yes, in fact, everything is consistent with satisfying the circuit. Right. So um, I'll say this again. So this is step one. I need to describe this algorithm. Step two is I need to prove that the algorithm works. Right? And step two actually has two parts. Right? Um, show that yes answers are correct. And show that no answers are correct. And the way to actually say this is, yes, answers are correct. Well, um, if sat of phi says true, then in fact, k is, the circuit is satisfiable. And then the no answers are correct. You could write this as, if the circuit, if the formula is not satisfiable, then neither is the circuit. But it's actually more convenient to write it this way. If the correct answer is yes, then in fact, I'll get a yes. That's the same as saying, if I got a no, that that answer was correct. Okay. Now, this is, again, one of these things that is somewhat counterintuitive about proving things are NP-hard. The transformation from circuits to formulas only goes from circuits to formulas is a one-way transformation. Nevertheless, if I want to prove that this transformation is correct, I have two things to prove. I need to prove that the circuit that I, that I got out, that I fed in, is satisfiable if and only if the formula that I transformed it into is satisfiable. And the mnemonic here is, it's an if and only if statement, and so I need two proofs one for each f. Um, I need to prove if, and I need to prove only if. Okay, so even though I'm doing the algorithmic transformation only in one direction, when I come to actually do the proof, I have two things to prove, and it feels like I'm proving it one way and then I'm proving it the other way, because that's actually what I'm doing. Right. Um, so uh, I think probably the thing that I should do at this point is stop and ask if there are any general questions about this whole strategy and defer any specific examples of this till Tuesday, just because we don't have enough time to actually go through an, a, a, a non-trivial example. Yeah. Write that algorithm. Okay. Now you need you need to give more details there in step one. That's where you say, okay, for this gate, I name all the wires, and for this gate, I write down the following clause, and I join the clauses together by hands. That that's what the the first line is hiding. 
right? Um, so one way that this is often done is I want to build an algorithm for circuit set. This is a black box I'm going to build where a circuit comes in and either a yes or a no comes out. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to plug in here a, a, a mythical algorithm for formula satisfiability and, and some sort of transformation that takes the circuit and produces a formula. Right? This is the part you write. You write this. This is assumed. All right? And then you have to prove that this algorithm you built is actually correct. And that proof of correctness boils down to proving these two statements, A and B. The first one says the output is true, implies that, in fact, the output was supposed to be true. And the second one says if the output is supposed to be true, then, in fact, it was. OK? We'll see lots of examples of this next week. So if this went over your head in terms of the theory or the proof of cook -Levin, don't worry about it too much. We'll get many opportunities to practice this. OK? Thanks. Yeah, sorry, question. Oh, yeah, the, the, the midterm things. Sorry, yes. This is what we have for the midterm right now. Detailed stuff will show up um, before your lab tomorrow. Thanks.